Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and I'm so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today, we're going to talk about how many people are in space right now, orbiting the Earth. We're going to visit Apollo 14 53 years ago. And, of course, we're going to honor a sad moment where we lost a great guy that supported this museum for 20 years in he is a legend of the Apollo era. Of course, that's Mr. Lee Solid, who passed away this last weekend at age 87. And uh, we wanted to honor him a little bit here with some of the, how I knew him involved with this museum. So we've got Marty on the board here. Marty, hello to you. And I, yes, I had a little medical emergency Friday. This is Monday, February 5th, 2024. And I thank everybody for their thoughts and prayers and concern as I had a little bit of an elevated blood pressure situation that uh, uh, I will get new medicine to take care of that. So anybody that's been around me in the American Space Museum knows I pretty much stay in motion around here. And at times, yes, I might bite off more than I can chew. And Friday may have been one of those days. And uh, but we've got a lot of things going. We've got a great team here led by Karen Conklin, our executive director. And it's volunteers like Marty and Connie McDaniel and Bill Whiting, I know who's watching today, that uh, really make this place hum. And we want to get you more involved in it. Speaking of Bill Whiting, thank you, Bill. Bill be, uh, gifted us with a bunch of stickers there. 321 American Space Museum, Titusville, Florida. Mine's already on my Jeep, and some of you will be sending them out to you to thank you for supporting us, Dave Stangy, and some of you other ones up there. I just see Dave Stangy going, I want that, Marty. So uh, thank you all for supporting us, uh, but uh, we're going to also sell them here in our gift shop for, I think, three bucks. But uh, thank you, Bill Whiting, for thinking about us. He's a snowbird from Michigan that's down here enjoying some warm weather and some launches. Um, we also want to let everybody know that the American Space Museum is a proud nonprofit, and there's a front of our museum there that uh, we're always anxious to take your money to keep our doors open, and there's the door that we keep open. So uh, from time to time, we're going to be soliciting special fundraising events this uh, later this winter and spring. So. Uh, we all, you all have been giving to us, and we appreciate those of you that have. But it takes a whole village of people to uh, help support us. Marty, I haven't used my hundred dollar bill in a long time. I used to hold up a hundred dollar bill and say that we need a bushel basket of those to keep this place open. There's our beautiful entrance to this humble museum. So thank you for thinking about us. And somebody who has thought about us is Steve Jokums. He is the uh, president of the Lake County Space Board, Spaceport up there in Illinois on the shores of Lake Michigan at Astra Performa. That means uh, to space through modeling. All right. And so go to Lake County Spaceport if you're a modeler. Steve uh, has a lot of decals that you don't have to paint. Like uh, how do you do those solar panels, Marty? Well, you go to Steve Jokums at his uh, LakeCountySpaceport.com, and there's the decals to put on your uh, space station uh, to make it look authentic there. That's the type of thing Steve does. So we appreciate you, Steve, uh, financially supporting our museum. He gave us 10% of his business's, uh, I think, half of his year proceeds there. We really appreciate that, and uh, we can find creative ways for you to contribute to us. So this is also... February, and there we've got some beautiful shuttles of the month of February, three, six, nine, ten, eleven of them launched in the month of February. We're going to be talking about those throughout the year, the, the month here. Uh, some really good missions there, like the last mission of Discovery on the bottom, 133. Uh, I, uh, Bob McCall, with the help of Tim Gagnon, our friend Patch there, you see a space station or a Hubble telescope service mission, STS-82. We had three shuttles launched on February 3rd. Uh, that's very unusual. And two on February 7th. So 
my good friend Kay Heyer, astronaut on STS-130, where they took the cupola up there. We'll be talking about that mission also. Andy Allen, another friend of our museum. He's involved with STS-75 in a deployment of the tethered satellite. So uh, we love talking about the shuttles of the month because we have to talk about astronauts. And astronauts, they're, they're just so few and far and in between. 611 human beings have left this Earth and orbited it. And uh, that is a number that is, I think, minuscule compared to the 60-some year space age. So, so enjoy, uh, stay curious with the shuttles of February all this month. Here is Mr. Lee Solid and his wife, Shirley, at the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, back in uh, uh Oh, uh, 19, yeah, 2019. Uh, and uh, we have you in our hearts, Shirley, and we're going to show a few pictures of how I knew this man. Uh, he is a very well known figure in the space industry. Uh, if you were an engineer and didn't know the name Lee Solid, you probably weren't much of an engineer, I'd say, Marty. Uh, he grew up in Martin, South Dakota. And this gentleman mentored me uh, as a professional here at the American Space Museum, was on our board of directors uh, for a long time. Uh, and Lee Solid is just a, 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 just a wonderful human being involved in a lot of things on the Space Coast. He started at Rocket 9 in the 1960s. And, uh, but we hold your whole family dear in our hearts and, and uh, uh the uh, I hadn't looked up the, the services, but we'll put that on Facebook. He died Friday after a short illness, had some medical issues going on, uh, and uh, he knew that his time had, had come several times when I talked to him last. But grew up in South Dakota and he always quipped, I'm just a farm boy from South Dakota. He went to the University of South Dakota as well as the School of Mines, the South Dakota School of Mines, and later became a Rocketdyne engineer. And he knew that he wanted to, uh, 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 probably was going to be on the family farm, but he had this knack for engineering and his dad pushed him into the School of Mines and he's glad he did. He, uh, he said it was so gratifying to be part of the Apollo 11 uh, moon landing and, of course, all other ones. Here's Lee back in our Cape Canaveral gallery. This was one of the first times I really got to know the gentleman. And sheepishly, I said, would you hold up this picture of a of an atlas exploding with your engines on it from Rocket 9? And he did. And I said, what does it make you think about that picture, Lee? And he said, well, Mark, that was... Uh, uh, a uh, a learning day. And in fact, this launch that exploded was in uh, March 1962, right after John Glenn's February 20th flight that we'll be celebrating this, this month of his Mercury 3 orbits. And then Scott Carpenter was going to be the next one to fly a Atlas rocket. And this blew up in between there. I got the date on the back and uh, uh, Lee said, hey, you know, it was a learning experience. We figured out what went wrong, and that never happened again. There's uh, Lee with that, that uh, knowing look in his eye there. Share a couple photos with you of Lee Solid here with Al Warden. Uh, this was in uh, 2019 at the 60th anniversary, uh, or I mean the 50th anniversary celebrating the Apollo 11 achievement. He was on a panel at Florida Institute of Technology, and I wonder what Al's saying there. He's going, that's BS, or yes, sir, I understand what you're saying there. But good to see these two gentlemen who are no longer with us now. Al died uh, in March of 2020 after this picture was taken. And this is one of my very favorite pictures that I've come across. Buzz Aldrin on the left, Tom Stafford on the right, and it looks like Lee Solid's in the middle referee in these two and uh lee's wife uh, shirley took this picture at a restaurant i believe it was um uh, it's either the general or or, or uh, uh buzz's birthday buzz is 90 i think he's 95 now happy birthday buzz yeah happy birthday buzz there you go good 
Uh, this is four or five years ago when he's lived uh, over here on the Space Coast. He moved to Los Angeles. And the General Tom Stafford uh, is uh, 93 years old. And uh, uh, he's kind of in failing health, I understand. So we need to keep his family in our prayers. And there's Lee Referee. And I go, Lee, what were they talking about? When I showed him this picture, he said they were arguing about uh, propulsion systems. All right. And Buzz wanted to go to nuclear energy. And Tom Stafford says the way we're doing it's just fine. But uh, what a great picture that is there of, of legend Lee Solid refereeing two astronauts that are legends. Buzz Aldrin on the left and General Tom Stafford, who does still live on the Space Coast. There's Lee at our shuttle fest a couple years ago. He gave a good talk about those SSME engines, the space shuttle main engines that are still in use now in the Artemis program. As I got my Artemis shirt on here. And of course, you all saw the, the background that Marty and I chose to talk about Apollo 14 uh, landing there at Fro Mero. And there's a picture of Lee. Uh, during COVID, he grew a beard. We had him on Stay Curious. I think three times he's been on Stay Curious. And over this weekend, I'm going to link you all to those so you can enjoy a little bit of Lee Solid. That's Jean Luc on the left, and uh, uh, Jean Luc and Silas. Silas is uh, the other grandson on the right. They did a documentary series that's still in the works on Pops there. And uh, Pops just got all of the people he knew in front of Jean Luc and, and Silas there. I'm, I'm in touch with Silas a lot on the right there. In fact, that young man told me that his pops had passed away because he knew I'd want to know and, and let, let the whole world know through our 11,000 people that follow us on Facebook. So uh, he looked great in a beard, too. And I think he did stay curious with him with the, 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 the beard there. So, uh, you know, just. I, we run across these people. This is why we're lucky to be at the American Space Museum. Uh, I wouldn't have known anything about Lee Solid had I not been here for the past six years. Uh, and then to learn about it, what he did in our space industry for Rocketdyne, which later became Rockwell. Lee Solid was responsible for every engine on the Saturn V rocket. And even the ascent engine on the lunar module had a one piece that Rocketdyne put in there uh, that uh, made the hypergolics work. So uh, there's one of my favorite pictures I took of Lee Solid. And, you know, just all I can say is we family, the American Space Museum, we're thinking of you, we love you, and we will never let this man's name be forgotten in space history, the great Mr. Lee Solid. Well, from seriousness to something silly here, there's the Apollo 14, and yes, they use the Roman numerals in the Wizard of Is. And this was a press sticker, okay, given out to the press corps, kind of tongue-in-cheek. Gary Hart is the artist that approved NASA of doing this. You see there, uh, King syndicated features there in 1970. So that's your press for you there, Tommy Usiak and Mark Usiak and... Carlton Bailey, when you go get your press uh, passes, this is the way NASA envisioned you guys there in the Apollo era there. There's also some cool stories, and we're not to go over a whole lot of Apollo 14, as I'm obviously a little melancholy today talking about Lee Solid. But he, he without Lee Solid, Apollo 14 probably wouldn't have been possible. And, of course, this was the resurrection of the Phoenix rising out of the ashes of Apollo 13. So they did a joke on the the backup crew of Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, and Joe Engel there that would have been the Apollo 17 crew, all right, because if you were the backup crew, three crews later, you were the prime crew. That was how Al Shepard and Deke Slayton ran the astronaut office. Well, here, Al Shepard put himself as the commander of Apollo 14. 13, actually, after having Maneri's disease in his ear cured with a, a simple operation that's simple now, but complex back then in the 70s. And uh, uh, Stu Rosa and Edgar Mitchell uh, were chosen for uh, as, as rookies. So Shepard had 15 minutes of fame. Anyway, you get the joke that Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote were interspersed into this patch called Beep Beep by the backup crew. 
Joe Engel was bumped, of course, for Harrison Schmidt, uh, X-15 pilot who later commanded two shuttle flights. Uh, Engel could have gone on either Skylab or the Apollo Soyuz test project. And he said, nope, I want to fly a winged space plane like I did with X-15. So uh, didn't seem, he was, of course, bothered he wasn't a, a moonwalker. Uh, it'd be immortalized that way. So they came up with this patch. And if you own this patch, we have seen them go uh, for prices of uh, up to $600. Usually they're around a couple hundred, uh, but uh, they've actually sold uh, for uh, uh, $649. Very rare. You might see four samples sold all year, but the backup crew put them everywhere. They put them in the lunar module. Every time they opened up something in the command module, one would fly out. It's even rumored that they tucked them uh, in the, the personal life support system. So some of these were actually on the surface of the moon. And as you look at it, the Roadrunner is the backup crew, and they beat them to the moon. They're there waiting for the gray-haired uh, Wiley Coyote. The gray hair uh, beard is for... Um, Al Shepard, who was 47 at the time. You got a pot belly there for uh, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who is known not to like working out too much. And uh, red hair there for Stu Rosa on there. So quite a clever patch with a lot of uh, information uh, built in there to tease these astronauts. So as you look at the full moon and you just go about the center of the moon to the left is where Fra Mero is. That was the destination for the Apollo 13. So why not just keep all the training and everything the same? Uh, and they sent 14 there. Now, now, uh, like I said, Shepard was going to be on 13, but he figured he didn't have enough training, wanted some more time in that lunar module trainer uh, at Johnson Space Center and here at the Flight Crew Training Building in, on Cape Kennedy. There's the crew there. Uh, Al Shepard, they're all gone now. Stu Rosa, red-haired on the left. Uh, a balding Edgar Mitchell on the right. Edgar Mitchell was very helpful to our Space Museum. I'm going to show you a picture here in just a second. He helped us raise money on that. Uh, there they are going over, you know, whatever they go over before the flight training on there. And, of course, Alan Shepard's daughter, Laura Shepard Churchley, she went to space on the anniversary of her, I think it was the 60th anniversary of her father's suborbital flight. Laura Shepard Churchley went up on um, the uh, Blue Origin suborbital flight with Michael Strahan, the football player and host of Good Morning America. And I think there were six people on that, maybe maybe four, but... I think they had six people on that flight. And Laura Shepard was out at the uh, astronaut memorial for the Apollo 1. I saw her out there, and she promised that she'll come on, stay curious, and talk about her famous father, but also the good work she's done as an ambassador for the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, which was founded by her father and the other six Mercury astronauts. Well, there is the Apollo 14 command module. Kitty Hawk was the name of the command module there. Uh, the lunar module was called Antares. All right. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I've seen Kitty Hawk out there many, many times. Uh, beautiful display. Uh, they once had a velvet rope around it. You could almost walk up to it. Uh, but the hatch is open and you can look inside of a 53-year-old spaceship that brought three humans back uh, from uh, orbiting the moon and two of them walking on the moon. There is Edgar Mitchell with our godfather, Charlie Mars, standing outside one of the many pylons that have astronauts or have space workers' names on it. There, uh, and uh, Charlie's still around. We lost Edgar Mitchell about 10 years ago. There is Antares on the moon. Apollo 14 landed on the moon uh, at 918, uh, uh, it was uh, 418 a.m. Now, here was something that was sort of like a, a bad twist of luck for the Apollo program. All right, we get Apollo 13 back. Apollo 12, of course, landed near the Surveyor Crater. 
and their their uh, live video camera got exposed accidentally to the sun and burned out the video tube. So we didn't have any live pictures from the surface of the moon. And it had been so great to see them walk down to that surveyor spacecraft. Uh, so after Apollo 11, no information on the moon live. So people go yawn. And then we had Apollo 13 in April of 1970. So again, yawn. We've got a delay. Okay. Uh, so on February, finally we get back to the moon on February 5th, 1971. And they landed at 4.18 in the morning, Marty. All right, and there's no 24-hour news service in 1971, no CNN, no uh, no Fox, none of that stuff going on, okay? It was just uh, the three ABC, CBS, NBC, and public broadcasting stations. So I'm not even sure that anybody watched the landing with Walter Cronkite or Jules Bergman or whoever you were watching. At 4.18 in the morning, I would have said, boys, let's go around another couple laps around the moon and then land but of course that changes the at the, the the shadowing there if you go out and walk around at night uh, an hour and a half before sun set or up before sunrise uh, they want that long shadow so they could see everything when they landed on the moon well the Antares landed a hundred and seventy five feet from its targeted landing site, the most accurate landing of the six Apollo landings, and that is credit to Alan Shepard, a Navy man, a Navy admiral, by the way, after this. Uh, they had a lot of trouble leaving Earth. Uh, they had trouble docking uh, Kitty Hawk with the Antares to get it out. Uh, uh, the docking probe had uh, was suspected, and they finally did get it, get it docked. Uh, and here is Antares on the lunar surface there, and it's at an angle, all right? And it was at a uh, such an angle that look at that, scooted in there like that, almost buried the, the lunar probe there. Uh, and this gave you an early indication. Look, Marty, it landed right in a crater and scooped up some of that crater on the other side there. And uh, Marty's done a great show to explain to you what that black gray on, on there is uh, that is your ink canal uh, up there and your Kapton foil is uh, more uh, yellowish and the real gold, dark gold is, uh, no, Kapton foil is a real gold and the Mylar is the on the, the, the stretch there. So uh, the fifth and sixth humans to walk on the moon redeemed the Apollo program after the near-fatal accident of Apollo 13, just 10 months earlier, okay? And Shepard, when he walked on the surface of the moon for the first time, said, it's been a long way, but we're here. And he stepped on the lunar surface at 9.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 5th, 1971, and that was covered by the press. Uh, history books tell the story of Antares, that it was slightly tilted, there was a surprise in the undulating ground at Fra Marrow. Okay, looking out the window of the hatch there that Marty, as a lunar module engineer for Grumman, an electrical engineer, Marty, you actually looked out those windows, but you were looking at the wall across the way, I'm sure. Uh, they took, uh, we know it, they were surprised by how fluffy and deep the lunar soil was called regolith. Actually, it's like trudging through uh, a foot of snow, maybe, in some areas there, and very demanding and uh, on, on the body. Uh, you also, scientific lies, know that they used the first lunar wheeled cart. They did two five-hour uh, moonwalks that accomplished their simple task. But everyone remembers the golf balls that Al Shepard hit on the moon, which were two Spalding balls with McGregor six iron attached to a lunar tool shaft. And, of course, Edgar Mitchell performed uh, ESP, extrasensory perception experiments, with Earth participants while he was on the moon without NASA's knowledge. Now, those experiments didn't go very well because the timeline that Mitchell gave the participants on Earth got messed up when they had trouble docking and had to stay in Earth orbit a couple of orbits longer and... Uh, uh, here is the look at the landing site. 
from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. What are the ways that we can tell where we were? All right. They landed. This Antares is there. The ALCEP experiments to the left uh, of Apollo Lunar Science Experiments. You can see the uh, when the lunar regolith is dug up, has churned up, is darker underneath. And you can see that. And then you see the path that they took by the arrows to try to get to the end uh, and look inside that crater. And they never did. They had to turn away because it was just too uh, hard for them to walk. They were getting overexerted and so forth on there. Now, this is the first time, this is, of course, the second lunar landing, but, I mean, the third lunar landing, and the first two did not have a buddy system air hose, but this one took with it that if someone's personal life support system broke down, the other one could plug in and keep the other astronaut alive with his to get back to the spaceship. There are the experiments that were set up. You can see the deep footprints of the astronauts in these craters that were around there. Uh, some of the experiments uh, were, of course, the uh, they put a laser out to be reflected upon, uh, but there was a, an earthquake, a moonquake a seismometer on there, other instruments to tell us if the moon had any appreciable atmosphere, which it does from the exhaust that, of, of six landings and, and other spacecraft that have hit there. The astronauts brought back 94 pounds of moon rocks and samples. And most of the samples were over 4 billion years old, much older than the lava bas basalts of the Apollo 11 and 12 that were almost a billion years younger. So this went from a smooth area of the moon to landing to a little rougher area on there. Marty, you have a question from somebody watching? Yes, we have a question from Dave Stange. Um, did you find Oh, did they ever discover what caused the initial docking problem when they tried to pull the limb out of the third stage? Good question, Dave. And I know they found that there was an obstruction in the in the collar uh, uh, that may have been ice, okay, that they think the ice may have melted in there. Now, if I'm wrong about that, uh, uh, sorry about that. But uh, 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 Marty's got here. People watching today? No, Mark. Those are the people on the. Uh... Oh, Marty looked up the, uh, the the crew that was on with Laura Shepard, Michael Strahan, the Blue Origin. Uh, I think that was the fourth one that flew. Uh, Dylan Taylor, Lane Bess, Cameron Bess, a a, a, a a I think it was a mother son, yeah. and and Evan Dick were on there. So uh, they all had paid some money. To go, I don't think Laura did, but Michael and Michael Strahan was chosen. Two, four, six. You know what? Uh, uh, I think uh, Jeff Bezos went on that one with his. No, Jeff Bezos went on another one with his brother. That's right. But Jeff Bezos was at the landing site there. So thank you for looking that up, Marty. And uh, I do think it was ice uh, from something that they figured uh, was in that. But I'm sure the annuals of Apollo 14 history. Had the right answer on there so and i got my artemis shirt on here against the moon just hoping that we can see that logo on the side of a astronaut's helmet or spacesuit there one day but you see the undulating planes you can already tell it looked different than the flat areas of apollo 11 and 12 and this is in the middle of the moon at the fra Mero area uh also to share with you there's a the, one of the experiments there Let's go full. There's the laser. I was going to say, someone said, Mark, they didn't put a laser uh, reflector on there. That's the laser reflector with prisms on it that from your backyard, if you got a laser powerful enough, shoot it through a telescope and it'll hit this and come back in a half a second. And that is a cute episode of Big Bang Theory. Uh, Marty, I know you've watched Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Remember that one when they got up on the roof in Pasadena? And hit it on there. Yes, go ahead, Marty. Yes, sir, hey, Mark, I looked up the Apollo 14 docking problem, and it's a small piece of debris prevented the automatic triggering of the latches. Good. So it's debris versus ice. Right. They brought the dock, docking collar in to inspect it, and I think they found some stuff in it, so they were lucky they got it to work, but they took 
uh, up to 10 times, I think, to try to do that. And then there was a question, would they be able to dock with the uh, uh, undock with uh, undock it and dock it again on the on the lunar uh, voyage? But uh, they, they had enough confidence that they could do that. Uh, Shepard and Mitchell spent uh, a total of 50, 33 hours on the moon, a little over a day, all right, and two EVAs, moonwalks. There are the pieces of uh, uh, tether that were used with a uh, simple pulley to put the box of rocks up there. Now, I do know for a fact that that would be Edgar Mitchell because they couldn't tell apart uh, Apollo 12 astronauts very well, and they did trade off the camera. Well, on Apollo 11, Buzz, Neil Armstrong had the camera, all but for about three pictures that Buzz took. Uh, so you don't see but one picture of Neil uh, on the moon, except in the visor of Buzz when he took that. But uh, So they put a stripe on there. And there's the stripes of the commander. They put stripes on the helmet and on his arms and legs there so you could tell them apart on there. And there's a proud Navy man, uh, our, America's first astronaut in space. And here he is on the moon. And you can see how dirty his boots are there. This is probably the first uh, landing there. Hey, both astronauts are in this picture, Marty, because there's a shadow of Edgar Mitchell covering up his boot. There is the, uh, they had like a rickshaw, they called it. It was just a simple little uh, wagon that was uh, built more like a rickshaw. If you uh, beach people are familiar with uh, these type of things you take on the, the Cape Canaveral or Cocoa Beach around here with extra wide tires so that you could move things around. And that, that was very handy, but it got stuck in this, this lunar regolith was a lot deeper than they thought it would be. And there's a beautiful panorama that we have for, for behind here showing you. The lunar module is up there in the upper right-hand corner, uh, LEM number 8. Okay, LM8, uh, uh, the tail number 5 was 11, 12 was LM6, LM7 was the ill-fated Apollo 13, but LM7's got to be the, the favorite one of all you Grumman workers, Marty, because it's, a stay, it's supposed to keep two people alive for two days, and it kept three people alive for a better part of four or five days. So uh, way outperformed itself there. Um they brought back, like I said, about 95 pounds of rock. They demonstrated that reasonably long distances could be covered on foot. Look, they're they're away from there uh, right there. And that would be Al Shepard with a core sample tube in his hand where they pounded down a core sample to get a introspective of the geology uh, over millions of years as this lunar dust just keeps piling up like dirt does on the earth and covers up ancient history. So, is that the final picture I got there? Yep, showing our wonderful uh, astronaut. Uh, let's go back there. Uh, and Al Shepard there. What a great American he was. You can also see on the helmet, you have some different shading and a little visor there that was added. Things that the Apollo 11 and 12 uh, astronauts said that were needed. And when you look at 17, they got a whole different rig on top of their their helmet to uh, keep it out there. Just go out on a bright day without sunlight in the middle of a parking lot someday and get kind of a feel about how bright that sun must have been on the moon all the time because they had no way to get a, away from it except to get under the shade of the lunar module. So Apollo 14, a great legacy of the Apollo era that our friend who were grieving over Lee Solid definitely had a lot to do with the success of this and uh, uh, all those engines on the Saturn V that got them to the moon and then the lunar module engine uh, once it's separated from the, the, the descent stage uh, had a little something of Lee Solid's in there too. So, Marty, you have any comments about uh, Apollo 14? I know 53 years flew by pretty quick for you there, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> I think it was last week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah right, right. You just got a paycheck from Grumman and, and handed it to your wife, I think, last week there. But uh, no, I mean, I, Marty's not a very, uh, I mean, you're a great guy, but he's an engineer. And you guys don't have the sentiments that I try to get out of you all the time. 
But you look up at that moon, Marty. It's uh, it's in the after midnight sky now. But you had a you've got some vehicles that you had your palm prints all over with gloves on, of course. And we're proud to know you. If you don't have any comments there, anyone else commenting about Apollo fourteen? Nope. Okay. Into obscure history again, but we hope to see these scenes again from humans on the moon. Looks like we're going to have to wait till something like 2026 to see it, maybe 2027. But uh, we think that they will do it eventually. Well, one thing that we're doing right now is thinking about how many people are orbiting the Earth on February 5th, 2024. And here's your answer, folks. 14 humans orbiting the Earth, all right? And there we have 11 people on the International Space Station. In the foreground are the Axiom 3 crew that's been up there for about 18 days. Let me get some of my notes on this here, the Axiom crew. Um, we've got uh, 14 astronauts orbiting the Earth. Three of them are on the Tangong Space Station, Chinese. They're, those guys are in the lower left-hand corner. This crew's been up there for 102 days. The Axiom 3 crew in the foreground there, we'll see another picture of them, have been up there 18 days. In between, you've got on the International Space Station, the Soyuz 24 crew that is three is, uh, two Russians and uh, uh, an American woman, Laurel. Uh, uh, what's Laurel's last name? Not Laurel. Yeah, Laurel Clark. No, not, not, not Lauren Clark's the, uh, uh, what is Laurel's name there? Laurel, ah, eluding me. I had them all down here, but that's okay. We're not going to go through all the names of the astronauts. We'll do that later. The accident later this week. Um, she was on a Soyuz. She had three people on the Soyuz. They've been up there 144 days. The SpaceX 7 crew has been up there 164 days. That's four astronauts there. So you got three Chinese, one Japanese, one from Denmark, three Russians, two American women, an Italian, a Canadian, a Turkish, and a Spanish uh, astronaut, which is actually Lopez Allegra there on the lower left-hand corner uh, on Expedition 70 there. He is an American citizen also, but they tout the Axiom 3 crew is being all international. Now, Axiom 3 crew is up there to figure out and get experience to add a module to the uh, space station. They were going to do it this year. I think they pushed it back the next year. And three other modules every year that's going to make a space station. Then they're going to separate from the International Space Station. Axiom will have their own space station to take uh, tourists up to even. So, Marty, you were checking out Laurel. What's her last name? O'Hara. O'Hara. Oh, you Irish are going to be mad at me for sure. <laughs> okay. How could I forget an O'Hara in space up there? And uh, uh, Jasmine Magoli is the commander of the uh, uh, sp uh, SpaceX Crew 7 there. So, uh, But interesting that no American male is orbiting the Earth outside of Lopez Allegra, who has a heritage of being born in uh, Spain. 14 humans orbiting Earth. I think the, uh, I'm going to say 18 is the record. We had uh, Peggy Whitson's Axiom crew coming back when we had six people on the inter on the, the Russian space station. Uh, so I think uh, 18 is the, uh, uh, because they had one more on the, they had 12 on the International Space Station and six on Tangong at that time. 611 humans have orbited the Earth, and 75 of them are women in the entire history of Earth. Eternity. And all eternity, that's right. Like the late Hugh Harris, voice of NASA, used to say, all eternity, these people are, are, are the numbers up there. But when's Axiom 3 coming back? Glad you asked. They're supposed to be back today, but it's been, uh, or they're going to come back Sunday, but uh, they have now okayed them because of storms going on the east coast and west coast of Florida where they want to land. They're not coming back. They're going to undock tomorrow morning at 9.05 
And that puts the landing about nine hours later, according to what I could find on uh, the Internet. So it's around 6 o'clock uh, Tuesday evening is when they're going to land. And uh, I know that when Axiom 2 came down, you could see the streak across the sky from the west coast of uh, Florida. If they land on the east coast, maybe we'll see them go through the sky, Marty, in daylight. But I'm going to be out there trying to look for it. And we'll pinpoint that time they're coming down for you on Stay Curious tomorrow. But you'll all be telling me the time on there uh, because they'll have it published there. Here is the Axiom crew in space. Uh, you've got a, a, a Turkish astronaut. He's on the, uh, he, I think he's on the far left there. Uh, and then you got uh, Lopez Allegra. They, this was his sixth space flight. He flew the first Axiom flight as commander, and he had four shuttle missions as a NASA astronaut in between that. So um, hope everything goes as planned. You have an Italian ESA astronaut there on the far right. Our friend uh, Alex Carl was in town to see him launch. He wasn't coming back for the landing. But the landing is going to look like this when they get that marshmallow spacex crew uh freedom is the name of this and this is the, the uh, third second trip to space i think for this uh, space capsule and there is the rig that uh, we see it parked out there at cape canaveral it uh might still be out there marty if we go out there tonight and have dinner but we got other plans um but there's the toasted marshmallow uh, chugging back to bring it back uh, to uh, uh, port here at Port Canaveral where it can be uh, sent off to uh, uh, California, I guess, to be reserviced. I don't know if they reservice them here or not. Have to find out about that. SpaceX, very secretive. Uh, hard to get anyone on Stay Curious because they're afraid they might say the wrong thing and get fired. But helicopters are the way to access there. They'll take the astronauts by helicopter. They probably... On this SpaceX 2, they've probably already been helicoptered back to Houston. And just in case you were thinking about space and all everybody up there, yep, Elon Musk Roadster is still orbiting Earth, somewhere between the orbit of Earth and Mars now. Uh, that famous Roadster that was launched on the first Falcon Heavy uh, is orbiting Earth, and you can track it. Just just uh, go Roadster in space or something like that, and I'm sure you'll find it out there. So. Well, Marty, thank you for a good Streamlabs job. Uh, uh, we've actually missed you. I didn't work with you at all last week as you were taking some time off and we had Selvin in here. We appreciate Steve Jokum's watching today and Dave Stange and Mark Usiak. Robert Law's up in Dundee, Scotland. Tommy Usiak's warming up a little bit there in Pennsylvania. Gary Gerald is in Collins, Georgia. Doug Forrest, thank you for pictures of the Endeavor. I'm going to Put your night pictures up there that I failed to do because of my little uh, blood pressure incident. Cliff Watson's watching in Pomona, Australia. He's getting anxious to come to the States. He's going to be here for the April 8th eclipse. Carlton Bailey, CB, thank you for watching. And Cynthia Rossi watching today. And each and every one of you wished me well in my little medical emergency. And I appreciate that a lot. Okay, appreciate you all thinking of me, and uh, I will be taking a little better care of myself and trying not to get so stressed out, So, which is uh, hard to do at a nonprofit where you want to do all kinds of things, but uh, we're grateful for the people we have to help us but can always use more volunteers, and we'll be sweetening the pot for some of you there. And again, thank you for the 321 stickers that's already on my Jeep. Bill Whiting, thank you for doing that. And uh, Bill will be, Bill likes being behind the scenes uh, for some obvious reasons about the job he had, uh, and uh, so we we respect that. But looking forward to coming up to your condo and watching a a single stick rocket take off here soon, Bill. Thank you for all you do. We love our we love our three two one decals, and we'll get you some you out of towners. He's okay. Hold your horses. <laughs> so. Marty, thanks again for a great Streamlabs job. Uh, we're going to look at the shuttles of the month of February on Tuesday, get some guests lined up here. We got Nick Thomas coming next Monday. 
and Nick wants to take picture, uh, take pictures, take questions from you all. Like we had a very successful question and answer session with launch director Mike Leinbach over a week ago. So Nick Thomas will be here next Monday. We're lining up some guests uh, all month and even into March to help you all stay curious. So until next time, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Thank you, folks.